Okay, everyone. Hello again. We are here with the Delaware State Health Assessment and Improvement Plan, the SHIP Partnership Coalition meeting. As you might recall, this is our third out of four meetings. And so I'm going to quickly run through our agenda for today. Just our quick welcome and objectives. We have a really comprehensive overview today of the state health assessment and and a nice update about what we've been doing as a part of the state health assessment. And in addition to us giving updates, we're actually going to have an opportunity for you all to chime in and give up given feedback for our uh, Q&A period. We'll take a brief break and then we're going to come back and we're going to have our SWOC analysis and that'll be led by Noel. She'll kind of introduce that to us and then we'll actually have an opportunity to go into some more detail in our breakout rooms and um, actually put the practice, the SWOC analysis into practice. So we'll have an opportunity to chat about that further in our breakout. And then finally, we'll wrap up and we'll talk about the next steps and we will plan for our next meeting and give you an update about what's to come for us and then we'll adjourn. Next slide, please. So in our previous meeting, our second, well, actually I should go back a little bit. In our first meeting, we actually introduced the idea of forming a mission and a vision for the Delaware Ship Coalition. And so during our second meeting, we actually said, we revised, we discussed, we added and subtracted from it, and actually we ended up voting on what our mission and vision statement were gonna be. So just to kind of recap where we're at, uh, we just wanted to share again with you our mission and our vision, particularly for those of you who are joining us for the first time. So our mission is, to improve health outcomes, well-being, and health equity across Delaware's communities and populations. Our vision, all people in the state of Delaware enjoy, all people in Delaware enjoy healthy lives and healthy communities. We had a great turnout in our second meeting and we were really excited to see that we had a lot of first time participants coming. So we wanted to revisit our vital conditions for health and well-being, the framework. And the reason that we wanted to introduce this to you all again, and just to kind of refresh is because this bit has been an underlying theme throughout our discussions in our previous two meetings. So what are the vital conditions? They address our upstream factors, specifically addressing questions such as what makes a healthy, safe, and vibrant community of opportunity? And there's a great deal of overlap between the vital conditions and the social determinants of health, because they get to the question of what all people need, um, what all people need all the time to thrive and to reach our full potential. And so when you look at the vital conditions framework, what it consists of are the reliable transportation, the thriving natural world, basic needs, humane housing, meaningful work and, and wealth, lifelong learning, and at the center of the framework is belonging and civic muscle. And now we will transition into our state health assessment update. Okay, that's great. So I think we've shared previously that as um, a part of the state health assessment, we look at a lot of different data, both primary and secondary data. So the primary data that you'll be hearing about today is new data that we have collected specifically through the state health assessment process. And it includes some community door-to-door -door surveying as well as community conversations. The secondary data that we look at is data that already existed from other sources, and we'll be sharing some of that with you today as well. So this is data from a lot of different surveys that already exist, from American Community Survey to County Health Rankings, et cetera. And we also look at data from existing assessments, both the Delaware Hospital Community Health Needs Assessments, as well as other Delaware organizational plans and community-based um, health needs assessments. Next slide. <clears throat> so as we present this data, we're happy to take questions in the, Q in the chat. So if you do have questions on anything that you see presented, feel free to drop your questions into the chat. We will answer some of them, as many as we can, um, in the chat directly. And anything that we can't answer will open up the floor for verbal um, um, answers after all of the data is presented. So feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go along. So now I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to share some of the data from our community surveys. Thanks, Kate. So with the community survey, this is part of that primary data. This is new information. Um, could you go back one slide? Um, our goal was to measure 
those vital conditions. So we took some time to look at um, other validated surveys, other questionnaires, um, and try to find questions that fit into each one of these categories so that we could get a, an assessment of how uh, Delaware residents were doing in these areas. Um, what were their challenges? What were their barriers? Um, what were the strengths? And we used uh, validated survey and sampling methods from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization. Uh, we came up with a plan and a questionnaire, solicited feedback from Division of Public Health, uh, and shared that questionnaire with some community partners to get some feedback as well to make sure we were on the right track. Uh, and our goal was to collect, conduct a survey in each one of the counties. Um, next slide, please. Now, before we sampled, though, we wanted to make sure that we were uh, hearing specifically from Delaware residents that we thought were the most vulnerable. So to do that, we used this framework called the Social Vulnerability Index. So if you can think back to the Vital Conditions Framework, there's a lot of overlap here. So we've lo we're looking at socioeconomic status, uh, such as poverty, unemployment, income, education, um, as well as all the way down to housing composition and transportation. So our goal was to uh, use this framework to focus on the most vulnerable Delaware residents. Uh, next slide. So using that framework, um, what's shown on the left-hand side of the screen, the dark blue areas, are those neighborhoods that were classified by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's SVI, or Social Vulnerability Index, as being the most vulnerable. So we looked at those dark blue areas that we'll call neighborhoods. And within that, we randomly sampled in two stages. First, we selected smaller areas or blocks and then random locations within those blocks. Uh, we sent teams out to go knock door to door, including in snow, as you can see on the right. And we then compared who we talked to, our sample. So that's what this blue um, circle is in the middle. So we compared who we talked to, to all of the people in those blue neighborhoods. And we compared things such as race, ethnicity, income, and education to make sure that they were in alignment so that we felt like we had a good sample, that we had good representation. Next slide. And we did have, we felt like they did line up really well. Um, and so the way that this all went down was that back in fall, um, last fall in Newcastle County, we went out for a couple of days in, in Newcastle and collected 185 surveys. Our goal was 210. So we got really close to that goal. Um, a couple sets of rates on here. Um, we've got a completion rate, a contact, and a cooperation rate. Um, I don't want to go too into the weeds with this, but suffice to say that that completion rate was kind of like our success. You know, did we meet, meet our goal? In each county, our goal was 210. We got pretty close, 185 in Newcastle, 178 in Kent, 168 in Sussex. Um, our contact rate is more of a measure of effort, so that's how many doors it took to knock on? How many um, homes did we actually approach? Um, so that you can see that we approached almost a thousand homes in Newcastle, uh, took fewer homes in Kent and even fewer in Sussex. Uh, cooperation rate, the last one is what you most often think of when you hear a response rate for surveys. So that is, who do we actually talk to? And then um, did they actually agree to take the survey? Um, I'm seeing one typo there on the Newcastle cooperation rate that we'll correct, but the uh, in general, all of these rates were um, in line with what we would expect for this type of work. Um, and we do it this way. We go door to door because we get a much better response than we would um, over the phone or um, through a, a direct mailing. Um, and uh, so overall, we felt like this process was um, a lot of work, but I think we got some really uh, good information, which I will now pass over to Leanne to go over some of those details. Thank you, Matt. Um, so this is one of the questions that we asked on that survey. We asked in the last 12 months um, if they were worried food would run out before they got money to buy more. So you can see in blue, we have Newcastle County, in orange is Kent County, and gray is Sussex County. 
Kent County was least concerned that they would run out of food uh, before they got money to buy more, followed by Sussex and Newcastle. Next slide. Here we asked the percentage of respondents that answered, I can access high quality K through 12 schools where I live. As you can see, the majority of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that they could access high quality K through 12 schools where they lived. Next slide. Here, uh, we wanted to ask about meaningful work and wealth. So one of the ways that we did that is we asked whether or not they thought their family living themselves or family living with them are financially better or worse off these days than they were 12 months ago. The majority of respondents in all three counties said they were about the same. However, you can see 18 to 28.7% um, said that they were somewhat worse off. And now I'll pass it to Braulio to present the rest of the vital condition data. Next slide. Also, we're gonna start with humane housing. Um, so the question that we asked was surrounding the percent of participants, participants worried about losing their homes. Uh, as you can see Newcastle and Kent County were about the same percentage wise in all three categories with 91.4 uh, saying no, 7.6 saying yes, and 1% um, have preferring not to answer. Sussex County uh, came in at 80.1, saying no, 16.4, um, which is a little bit over, over double, saying yes, and 3.5%, which is about three, a little bit over three times um, the other group saying they prefer not to answer. Now we're looking, uh, we're moving over to reliable transportation. So the percent of participants in the past 12 months where, where reliable transportation kept them from medical appointments, meetings, work, or things needed for daily living. Um, we're gonna start with the highest being Kent County that came in at 93.1% of people saying no, they had no issues getting to uh, where they needed to go. Um, second was Sussex County uh, coming in at 87.2, and then uh, Newcastle. 79.4% uh, of people saying that they know that in the last 12 months, uh, reliable transportation did not keep them from uh, meetings, work, or things they needed for their daily life. Moving on from there, uh, yes, the highest was Newcastle coming in at 19%, um, almost double that of ever, any other county. Kent, um, Kent County coming out in with the lowest at 7.0% and Sussex coming and right there in the middle with 10.6% of people um, in Texas County saying yes, transportation did keep them, reliable transportation did keep them from attaining their daily living needs. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now we're gonna be living, at, looking at the thriving natural world the percentage of participants that felt safe accessing parks and research, uh, recreation services. Um, yes, recreation services. The, uh, sorry, percentage of, of participants that felt safe accessing parks and recreation services in their neighborhoods. Um, we're going to start with Kent County coming in at 84.4% of people saying yes, they were uh, comfortable accessing Parks and Recreation Service, Newcastle County at 81.0. And then you can see here that Sussex, Sussex County actually had the opposite relationship with majority of their um, residents saying no, they did not feel comfortable accessing, rely, um, accessing parks and recreation centers. If you guys don't mind at this time, if you could please uh, put in the chat what could be some of the reasons for them not feeling comfortable access, accessing um, their parks and recreation centers, and that can be for like any of the counties, but specifically Sussex. Just gonna give you guys a minute to do that.
you guys can feel free to continue to drop those into the chat. We're going to move on to the, uh, the next section. So this was civic muscle, <clears throat> sorry, civic muscle and belonging. Uh, so the percentage of participants willing to become involved in your community by working with others to make things happen. Um, you can see here that the groups were, were, they were kind of a little bit stacked here and there with most of the difference being between willing and somewhat willing, but um, Newcastle had the highest percent, um, Kent County, sorry, had the highest percent of people being very willing to help. Um, Kent and Sussex came in at a time for the number of people being willing and then somewhat willing Newcastle had um, a little bit more than the other groups and then not that willing. Um, you can see that the percentages start to get a little bit lower, but Newcastle uh, is coming at the, at the top there. And then for the people that prefer not to answer, Newcastle and Sussex came about the same. And then Kent County, um, they had 2.8% of people not willing. I'm preferring not to answer as far as their willingness to become involved. Now we can move on to the next uh, section and Danielle will be taking over from here. Thank you, Valio. Um, so next we're gonna discuss the community conversations that we had scheduled. So community, community conversations are held in addition to the surveys to learn about broader needs and resources related to the overall community health. Um, so we conducted two out of our three scheduled community conversations already. In Newcastle County, we conducted this at the Bellevue Community Center on March 8th, and we had 15 participants. In Kent County, this was done with Network Connect on March 20th, and we had 11 participants. And in on April 10th, we're gonna conduct it in Sussex County with the First State Community Action Agency at 5.30 p.m. So when, some observations that we had from the two counties that we did go to was that when we did ask about barriers that people have experienced accessing the vital conditions, some socioeconomic factors came up, but a big factor that was discussed in both counties was the lack of adequate transportation that Braulio also touched on. Despite this, there was a common theme of unity among both um, community conversations that we had when asked what their community does well when it comes to making sure people have accesses to resources. Many re residents listed examples of the community coming together to support each other during the pandemic or through personal experiences such as house fires. They made sure to offer either groceries or just general support to their um, neighbors. So that was something that was definitely common in both counties. Next, we can discuss our policy scans. Thank you. So um, a policy scan is just systematically gathering and analyzing policies in a particular area of interest. So we focused on the vital conditions and the purpose is just to identify existing policies in order to inform future programs and policies. So for example, um, House Bill 123, it provides financial assistance for higher education for youth ha who have been in foster care. And this aligns with the lifelong learning because you're providing a good education for all that ensures all people, regardless of their age, background, or race in general, are set up for success and have the opportunity to reach their full potential. Another example is House Bill 222. Um, currently, blood lead levels, screening, and testing rates are well below what the Division of Public Health would expect. So this act simplifies the requirements and process for healthcare. It provides and eliminates any confusion that may be causing low compliance rates for screening and testing. And this aligns with basic needs for health and safety because you're allowing access to routine and critical health care, which is important to maintain to maintain health and well-being. And our final example is House Bill 200. So many of the state's waters do not meet water quality standards to support their designated uses, which is for drinking, swimming, or just um, 
life in general. So the Clean Water for Delaware Act establishes a framework for assessing needs and implementing projects that support Delaware's effort to improve the quality of the state's water supply. And this aligns with uh, the thriving natural world vital condition, which includes clean air, clean water, clean land, and a well-functioning ecosystem. So next we will discuss health disparities and I'll pass that off. Thank you, Danielle. This health disparities are preventing differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by population that have been disadvantaged by their social or economic status, geographic location, and environment. Many population experience health disparities, including people from racial and ethnic minority groups, people with disabilities, people who are LGBTQI, and people with limited English proficiency and other groups. Next slide, please. Now, this is a slide showing the disparities in L outcomes. This is a secondary slide, and uh, the data are from American Community Survey 2019. And as you can see, the infant mortality, the infant death is um, infant death in less than one year of age per 1,000 life birth. By telling my birth, the state of Delaware is doing not so well because the national benchmark is 5.8, while the state of Delaware has 6.1, 6.9 as their benchmark. The disparity is more pronounced in the Black and African American community compared to the white and the Hispanic community. Next slide, please. Interpersonal violence death. Interpersonal violence death is um, death uh, per 1,000 of population. And this data is from the American Soviet Survey Community 2019 also. The, is that the number of deaths due, due to homicide per 100,000. Delaware State is 6.1 of the average, while the national average is 5.9, which means the Delaware State is not faring well in also this in this slide. And you also note that Black and African American uh, exceeded the national and the state average of interpersonal violence deaths among the other ethnic group. Next slide. Drug overdose. Drug overdose data shows the data according to American community survey 2019. This is the average number of deaths from drug poisoning per 100,000 population. The lower state exceeded the national average, which is 2.18. And Delaware has 40.4. Deaths due to drug poisoning is more prevalent among the non-Hispanic white ethnic. Ethnic group. Next slide, please. Now, this slide shows the youth risk behavior survey in national in, in national and Delaware high school student. It measures feeling sad or depressed almost almost every day for two weeks per year. Now, if you notice the blue, the blue tick is the national, while the orange is the, the is for Delaware State. Now Anxiety year, depression year is reported as people who responded that they felt a certain type of way in people who reported that they felt a certain type of way within a year and they felt really sad and bad about something going on in their life. While anxiety year students who reported that they felt nervous or anxious more than half of the days in the past two weeks. Now, Delaware State is not doing so well compared to 
Delaware State is better than the national average because the, na the national average is higher than Delaware State. Among the data collected, female actually complained that they were, female complained more of um, anxiety than male. While among the ethnic group, the black on the other races complained more of depression and um, after the other races, then we have the white, non-Hispanic white coming in a second among those who experience the um, depression in the past two weeks by sex, race, and ethnicity among 11th grade students. Overall, we have about 24% of um, participants who responded to this survey. Now, in this survey here, we talk about mental health among the LGBT, LGBTQ students in eighth grade. Now, the anxiety here is reported that students who respond that they have felt very nervous or anxious on more than half of the days in the past two weeks, while depression is reported that students who responded that they've been bothered by feeling down, depressed, or hopeless on more than half of the days in the past two weeks. And as you can see, the LGBTQ students reported more depression compared to, reported more depression and anxiety symptoms compared to heterosexual in Delaware State. Next slide, please. This slide talks about the disparities in, the disparity in behavioral health. And disability here is defined as, is defined in the BRFSS as the, at least one of the following serious difficulty hearing, serious difficulty seeing, serious difficulty concentrating, remembering or making decisions due to physical, mental or emotional condition, serious difficulty walking or climbing stairs, difficulty dressing or bathing or having difficulty doing errands alone because of a physical, mental, or emotional condition. And among those classified under disability, we noticed that current smokers, former smokers, um, have a higher percentage, have a higher percentage compared to behavioral health compared to adults without disabilities. And never smokers, without disabilities also have a higher rate of viral health. Current e-cigarette use can actually be seen that it's higher than the, in higher, in high, it's higher in adults with disability compared with in adults without disability. Without disability. Being drinking is also higher in adults with disability compared with adults without disability. Mental on LD, mentally on LD for 14 days in the past 30 days is in the past 30 days is also higher in adults with disability compared with those without disability. Ever had depression when actually they had ever had depression, you can actually see that it's higher in adults with disability compared to adults without disability. Next slide, please. What does this disparity mean? Vital conditions, social determinants of health are the condition in places where people live, learn, work, play, and worship that affect a wide range of health risks and outcome. Longstanding inequities in this key area of vital condition or social determinants of health are interrelated with influence, are interrelated and influence a wide range of health and quality of life risks, life risks and outcome. Examining this layered health and social inequities can help us better understand how to promote health equity and improve health outcomes. Next slide, please. Inequities and vital condition continue. This data is from the American Community Survey, and this shows the median household income. Median household income, the lower state is faring better compared to the general, compared to the national average. And among those who had a better income in the state of Delaware, we found out that Asian and Asian America had more income compared to other races, while the American Indians and Alaska Native had poor income compared to other ethnicities. 
Next slide, please. Now, according to the slide here, it talks about the, the blue tick talks about the cost burden, while the orange one talks about severely cost burden. Now, cost burden here is defined by a rental household that spends about 30% of their income on housing costs and utilities, while um, the one on the orange one, the severely cost burden, it's are those who spend about 50% of their income on rent and utility. As you can see, the cost burden is, the cost burden among the middle income, uh, it's better than compared to the other um, income earners. Extremely low income earners actually have the worst outcome with them having extremely low income. They spend, in, the, in their cost burden, they spend about 98, about 89%, sorry, about 89% of their income on rent and utilities. And also this group sent, spend about 77% of their income on rent and utilities. This, they experience the worst of the two, um, of all the four income, income represented on this chat. Next slide, please. Now, the next slide is talking about adults with a high school diploma. And we, this data is according to American Community Survey 2021. This is the percentage of the population age 25 and older who are high school, who have high school, who are high school graduates or higher, or possess higher degree. The average high school diploma earners in, is higher in Delaware compared to the national average. Hispanic and unspecified race make up the least number of diploma earners, while the white and white, black, and multiracial makes up the I while black and white uh, make the black and white ethnic, ethnic group make up the population of those with high school diploma. Next slide, please. Computer and internet access. According to the American Community Survey 2009, the percentage of the population in households with a computer and a broadband internet subscription shows that um, average number of Delaware residents with computer and internet access is greater than the national average. The native Hawaiian and Pacific Highlanders has the least computer and internet access in Delaware compared to the Asian multiracial and the white ethnic group. Next slide, please. I will pass this over to Kate to talk about equity. Thank you, Dr. Kate. I'm so awesome. <clears throat> interesting disparities and we all know that those exist and many of you are working really really hard to address that so what on a positive note what are we all aiming for together we really want to use health equity as a frame as a lens to approach this entire state health assessment and improvement plan so we're aiming for health equity which is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health and we know that to get to a point of health equity, we have to work together to address historical and contemporary injustices, overcome economic, social, and other obstacles, and eliminate preventable health disparities. Big picture, we have to work together to change the systems and policies that hold these challenges in place to get to health equity. So um, we're gonna go now into Q&A. So can I ask you, Noel, could you pull the slides down? Let's open up. Um, <clears throat> open up for questions. Now, I know that we had some questions in the chat related to um, the demographics of the surveys and disaggregation of data. So can I ask Matt to um, help us address that question? And Matt's sharing his screen so that you all can see some of that data. Yes, let me uh, pull that up. So yeah, there were um, a lot of questions about um, how, what demographics we compared to, um, 
and how we determine the sample size. So I want to start with um, demographics because that's what I have on the screen. Um, and this, you are not intended to be able to see all those numbers from here, but I just want to show you and let you know that this is the table that we pulled together and put in a report for each of the county surveys to compare um, who we talked to with who we hoped to talk to and then to the county overall. Um, so this will kind of break it down um, bit by bit. So um, first we, you know, the way this table is set up is that the sample percent is the percent of people that we, that answer the question in that way. Uh, and these are weighted percentages. So it accounts for um, the selection probability because we didn't just do a random uh, sample. It was a two-stage uh, random sample. So there was unequal chances of people being uh, selected. But there's the percent here, and then there's in parentheses, the 95% confidence interval. So that is uh, where we can say with 95% confidence that we think the actual um, value would be. Um, the next column is the um, sample frame percentage. So that is those dark blue areas that we said were the most vulnerable um, neighborhoods within Delaware. So that's the percentage for that particular value. So in this case, we have, we're estimating that about 53% of the population um, within the, those blue neighborhoods identify as female. We talked to um, about 49, which is pretty good. So we, you know, we feel like that's very close. Um, and then we're also comparing that to the county frequency. Um, and just to say that these are all sourced from different areas, so there's going to be some misalignment due to that. Um, we are comparing to the most recent and reliable census data. The census provides the best estimates for all of these um, socioeconomic um, variables. Um, some of them are updated. Well, they're all updated annually, but some of them we have to look at over a five-year period so that we have this margin of error, this plus or minus, um, so that it's smaller, so it's more reliable. Um, so we also looked at age, um, keeping in mind that we only spoke with people 18 and older. Um, we expect our sample percent to be slightly skewed, and it was. Um, and then race ethnicity. So um, this is where, you know, again, part of the social vulnerability index is um, looking at uh, non-white populations. Um, so populations that are, we think are more vulnerable to, um, uh, or have more health disparities as we've seen. Um, and so this is where that shows that, you know, Kent overall, um, these numbers are much different, right, than who we talked to and we who we ended up talking to our sample percent looks pretty close to what the actual sample frame was. So these aligned fairly well. Um, you know, sure, we're, we missed a Hispanic population by a bit, but these are within all of these are going to be within this 95 percent confidence range. So this is four to 17 percent would be our estimate. Um, and then we're we're calling this the actual, even though even that's another survey, but it's a good survey. Um, we also looked at um, education. And this is where, uh, you know, sample size came up and asking about um, disaggregating data. This is disaggregating the results, right? This is breaking things down into different subpopulations. And this is where um, our sample size and the sampling method starts to break down a little bit. It's not intended to, um, give you precise results for lots of different subpopulations. It's intended to give you um, reasonably precise results for the entire population. Um, but even when we do break it down, these are generally falling within the 95% confidence interval. Uh, and then income, we also looked at lots of different bins. We wouldn't expect these to align perfectly, but you know, overall, um, if you're looking at Kent County has, you know, one in five earning more than 100,000 compared to the sample frame at 10%, that's about half. And we talked to about 13. So these are, you know, these are off in parts, but, you know, something else to note is that a lot of people don't want to tell you how much they earn. So one out of three people that we talked to refused to answer this question. So it's hard to read too much into the results here. 
um, but knowing that overall we felt good about how these aligned. Uh, any questions about how we sampled the sample size disaggregating demographic comparisons? So much for sharing. Do you mind um, pulling your slides down and let's see, you know, we'll just open this up to the gallery view of everyone. Um, I think we answered most of the questions in the chat and, and thanks for addressing those additional demographics questions. So let me just say, if you have additional questions now, please feel free to either drop it in the chat or raise your hand so that we can open the floor to your question. looks like Gwen has a question or comment. Yes, thank you. Um, I had raised a question in the chat about being able to break the data down that you were presenting today by race and ethnicity. Um, and I think the response was that um, you were not going to probably not be able to do it by county because the sample sizes were so small, but you're going to try to do it at the state level. Um, <clears throat> I really hope that you're able to do that because I think we all know that that you're telling one story now, and then we'll uh, another degree of granularity around this is going to help us e even more precisely identify what the what the real disparities are. I mean, we have a sense of them because of just our practical experience, um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing you know, what your, at least your analysis at the state level kind of shows about the difference between, you know, the various, uh, you know, racial ethnicity groups um, and what that tells us about the health disparity picture. Looking forward to looking at that data as well. And as Matt mentioned in the chat, um, we can do that at the state level. So um, we'll, we'll definitely be looking at that. Thank you. Um, other, another question in the chat is what are the demographics of the small focus groups, the community conversations? Leanne, can you address that one? I don't have that information offhand, but I would say majority of respond, uh, participants were black and white in both counties. Thanks, Leanne. Can I follow up? Cause that was my original question. I apologize. I didn't raise my hand. Um, but I'm just wondering, I know there were some concerns about, for example, a lower Hispanic uh, response rate, and would it have been possible to oversample in the small focus groups for those um, populations which were at a lesser response rate than you would have wanted for that quantitative, quantitative survey? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand your question, but I know that one of our goals was to have a predominantly Hispanic um, community conversation in Sussex County. And I had a very difficult time um, connecting with that community or organizations that work with that community. Um, so I imagine that we will have um, the similar racial uh, breakdowns as we saw in Newcastle and Kent for our last community conversation. From Leah in the chat, can we show the slide with the door-to-door -door results again regarding overall vulnerability for all counties? I'm not sure which slide that is, but Matt, are you able to project your screen and address that one? Yeah, is, are you asking about this slide? Hopefully, because I wanted to talk about this a little. If not, was it this slide? <laughs> uh, I think it's the the slide. Um, I think it might be the slide after that one. I can't remember. I'm sorry. Yeah, this one right here. Okay. This is the one you guys went door to door, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, so that's the total number of surveys we completed um, in each county and then different um, response rates that we calculated. So, you know, our goal was to get 80% and um, the cooperation rate is, you know, really those people that you talk to that say, yes, I'll take your survey, um, which 
60 percent, 50, 60 is what we see, sometimes 80, but, um, you know, a typical mailing is like five or two percent. So we know that with these higher response rates, there's less chance for bias to be in the sample. So we feel we feel better about it. Um, was there a specific question about this one, this slide or? Um, no, I just wanted to like see it again. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, while, while I have the floor, I just want to reiterate that, um, you know, a big reason why we used the social vulnerability index is that uh, we know that it, it, all, it looks at those populations that we think will have the highest um, rate of health disparities. Um, so while we can't disaggregate within the county, in a way we kind of already have, we're looking at that the high, most the qu quarter of the population that we think is the most vulnerable. Um, so they have higher rates of poverty, higher rates of unemployment, uh, lower income, higher rates of um, people without their high school diploma. So, um, you know, we we made that decision up front um, to focus on these populations. So um, while we might not be able to disaggregate every single question by every race, ethnicity category that we want, um, we do know that some of these results are reflecting some of the populations that we think are most vulnerable. Screen share again for just a second. Let's open it up to the to the gallery view again. Um, so hopefully that was some more um, data to answer your questions on demographics and sort of sampling. Um, I appreciate the, the explanation of the social vulnerability index and hopefully Gwen that addresses some of your concerns as well. So the, really the sample is, you know, come already comes from a vulnerable population and that kind of helps us get to the disparities. Um, okay, any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand or unmute. There were some questions in the chat. Um, next one is, uh, what are the next steps? That's great, thank you. Um, so great question, Anson. Um, the surveys are part of a the overall state health assessment um, report. So the next steps will be, um, there's one more coalition meeting for this state health assessment coalition. And that um, <clears throat> I believe is in June. And so between now and then this um, team is going to be pulling together all of the primary data, the secondary data, putting all of that and um, some of this other contextual information that we've gathered through the coalition meetings from you all, putting that into a draft state health assessment report. And that will be shared with all of you um, for your own commentary. Um, so it will also be shared for state public comment. So those are the next steps in the, in the process. And then basically what we all come to um, agree upon for the data for the state health assessment will then lead us into a process of co-developing a state health improvement plan together. <clears throat> Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Ms. Smithers. Kate, I think you may have answered some of my question, but in looking at um, the vulnerability index, I know in the area where I am, uh, the vulnerability index is extremely high. But it does not look, you know, when we look at the data, it doesn't reflect that kind of vulnerability because we have pockets of poverty. And overall, it looks like the state of Delaware is doing pretty well. But we know there are a lot of disparities. And I'm wondering how that would be reflected in the report and if the report will guide the state's priorities in terms of where funding will go. For example, I noticed that there is a high rate of overdose among the white population, but that's not so true of, among other populations. So I'm just wondering how this whole study will be used to guide the, the state's priorities in terms of how it addresses disparities. The state health assessment is intended to be, and the improvement plan, is intended to be a collaborative 
multi-sector, multi-stakeholder process to come up with a plan that <clears throat> we can all agree to and buy into. That said, it is also intended to guide state action and investment priorities. So that's why it's so important that all of you are committing your time and are here to influence the process. And we really, really appreciate that because your voices are going to help influence <clears throat> what the priorities are that come out of the state health assessment and um, implementation plan. Um, Karen, you've got a question. I do, sorry, trying to unmute here. I just wanted to follow up on, on the conversation previously about the lack of diversity in or, or availability of the Hispanic population. So I'm just wondering how are we, what are our next steps? How are we going to fill that gap when it comes to the larger needs assessment? So the, the community conversations and the CASPERS are almost done, but there are other elements to the needs assessment. So how are we filling that gap and making sure that the Hispanic population and any other populations in Delaware, such as the Haitian Creole or you know, other ones are gonna be appropriately accounted for in the overall needs assessment? Probably a few opportunities and I invite other members of the team to chime in on this. Um, is that we can, um, a few of you have kind of shared connections related to the Sussex County um, conversations. So that's helpful to hear. So we can sort of see what additional primary data we can get um, that would better support information from the Hispanic population and Haitian Creole. Um, we can also look at se secondary data that we may not have presented today but that uh, you know, other sources of secondary data for those populations specifically, and we can pull that into the state health assessment. So what, what I'm hearing you asking is, is that we go ahead and do that. So um, we'll, we'll look into that, Karen. Thanks for that recommendation. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I don't see any other hands. Any final questions on the data that we've presented today or, or other thoughts before we take a break? We have one more question in the chat, Kate. Two more questions. Oops, okay, sorry. Suzanne, where does access to arts and art making broadly conceived and their impact on health and well-being fit into the index? Yeah, great question, Suzanne. So um, conceptually, that would fit into the index in terms of belonging and civic muscle at the center. Um, that includes access to arts and culture, generally speaking. Um, and if you, what I will also do um, while we're on break is um, attach a one pager on the vital conditions framework, as well as descriptions of each of the areas of the vital conditions, so that you all can take that and use that and reference that in your work as well. Um, so next question, Deb Burke, does BB have any data that would be helpful for Sussex? Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm sure that they do. And we have actually looked at the community health needs assessments from all of the hospitals. So we want to be really cautious that, you know, obviously all of this data does not need to be newly collected through the state health, ass health assessment. Lots of organizations already are gathering excellent data. We want to use that data as well. So all of those community health needs assessments from hospitals um, have been reviewed and we're looking for themes across those and those and that data will be represented um, in the state health assessment uh, draft report. Okay, and along those lines, if I could just add to Sue's questions earlier, um, and I mentioned this in the chat, that in addition to some of the um, highlights of the data that we're presenting today, and obviously we can't present it all, it's all, it's, it's a lot of it's going to be included in that draft report that we circulate to all of you. Um, but we also um, uh, are identifying themes that have come out with a lot of conversations from all of you. Um, for those of you that joined us at our very first meeting in December, we went into breakout groups um, for um, uh, four of the seven vital conditions. And each breakout group um, had an opportunity to talk about those vital conditions. Um, assets, needs, and other things, um, and concerns, and contacts that we're cat. We've captured our students, took copious notes, 
and we are um, going through all that data and identifying those themes. And then we finished the other seven uh, remaining con vital conditions uh, at the February meeting. And so you all might remember um, talking and the facilitators moving about those different rooms and everyone getting a chance to talk about all those different conditions. So um, arts and um, access to arts and things did come up, as Kate mentioned, in the belonging and civic muscle conversation from many, um, many of you in the group. And we took progressive notes. It was like a progressive dinner, you know, you moved around and we just kept adding and adding to what the group before said. So it's a really um, comprehensive. Um, so that will also be included in the report if that helps. Give it one more minute for anybody to unmute or raise your hand. <clears throat> okay, so seeing none, you're also obviously welcome to, to put check questions into the chat at any point during this meeting. Um, but what we'll do now is take a quick break. Um, we're going to take a five minute break and then we welcome you to come back and participate with us in uh, breakouts on the um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges assessment. So five minute break, please come back at 12.03. Thank you. Okay. So as Kate said, uh, we're gonna spend some time for the remainder of our meeting. Uh, we've we, um, meeting in breakout rooms. Um, and just to kind of set up the stage, uh, we're gonna be assessing the environment to really identify some strength, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges. Many of you I know, if you've done any strategic planning, some folks call that a SWOT analysis. Um, we're calling it a SWOC. We're thinking we'd like to think of challenges more than more than threats. Um, I think SWOT analysis came came out of the military. We're not we're not approaching it that way. We're approaching it in a more um, community health lens. So we're looking at those those type of challenges and opportunities. And uh, just as a reminder. Uh, for those that might not be familiar with the process or if it's been a while since you've done it, uh, <clears throat> strengths and uh, weaknesses are more uh, around internal strengths and weaknesses of the um, organization. And in this regard, we're talking about this SHIP coalition, the group of all of you that have come together and your respective agencies and organizations that are doing work to promote health improvement and, and move us toward a goal of health equity and health improvement in Delaware as part of the SHIP mission and vision that you've all helped uh, draft. And, uh, and then opportunities and challenges are things that are more external to this coalition or to your respective organizations or groups, or if you're representing a, a neighborhood or a grassroots coalition, et cetera. Um, and, and so uh, we really see that these uh, strengths and opportunities um, or those things that are helpful that are really going to help us move towards our um, goal and our mission um, of achieving improved health and health equity in Delaware. And then, of course, weaknesses and, and challenges are more harmful, things that we think are going to impede our ability to uh, achieve our mission um, and what we're, we're, we're trying to do through this work here. Now, um, it's hard, I know, to have this conversation. If we um, are a newer coalition, which this group is, and we're really trying to just understand, you know, who we are, who's at the table. So I just want to spend a minute or two sharing. Um, for the some of you have been able to join us since the first meeting in December. Some of you have been part of ship planning, uh, um, as um, that the Pub Division of Public Health has helped um, convene and and manage this project for many years and multiple iterations. And some of you are. Uh, many of you are rather um, new to this process. We did a stakeholder analysis in December, and we did find out that uh, about 50% of you are brand new to Delaware State Health Improvement Planning. So it's we really are great to have um, more seasoned folks that have been around many years doing this, um, and also newcomers um, that are really willing to get involved. Um, it's so important, as Kate said, to really have a collaborative process. That's critical to... Um, what would our team would like to help achieve. We know that public health is very invested in um, having it be collaborative and the public health accreditation board really sets the stage for ensuring that any state or local health departments that are going through this process um, are also ensuring that it's collaborative and we have a, a real robust and diverse group of stakeholders, um, not just across the state geographically, not just racially or ethnically, 
uh, uh, but you know, also in terms of power, um, if you're working for state institutions or government agencies or businesses, or if you're um, local residents or grassroots organizers, really having that mix on um, faith-based communities, you name it. So who is um, on the Delaware ship and who makes it up? We have about 55 unique agencies that are, um, or, or individual kind of groups, whether it's grassroots coalitions or others that are participating in the SHIP coalition um, since we had our first meeting in December. Um, the biggest sector represented is healthcare uh, organizations. We also have a lot of human and civil rights groups that do um, advocacy and other work um, that are involved, um, health promotion and uh, disease prevention. Um, groups that, that aren't necessarily doing healthcare services, but are doing health education and other prevention work are involved. Uh, community development planners um, have a lot, and that's also a lot of newcomers, I think, to the table. And we're really excited about that because as you know, from the vital conditions, um, you know, health is uh, also has a lot to do with the thriving natural world and reliable transportation and all those things that our community development groups and, and planners and humane housing and the housing advocates um, uh, really uh, uh, work on. And we know that they have a really critical role as well in how um, communities thrive in terms of health and well being. Uh, we have violence prevention folks. We know that that's um, and uh, folks that work on violence and trauma. Um, and we know that's critical as a basic health and safety need. And also very important in terms of belonging, sense of belonging. Um, and feeling free from discrimination um, and safe uh, and um, and feeling like people can show up to be their authentic selves um, in, in every aspect of, of their um, community. Education folks are at the table um, as well, another vital condition, and then transportation, as I said, and housing. We kind of um, split that up. I know some community development folks do, do some of that as well, but um, we did want to show that we do have people specifically working on transportation, you know, and housing. So um, many sectors are involved and um, you are um, welcome to um, have others join um, in this process. Uh, if you go to DelawareShip.org, there's information on the SHIP Coalition. Um, folks can email us at info, info at DelawareShip.org um, and we will send them the meeting invites uh, and um, it is a um, open invitation for, for folks to, to join. So I'm next, I don't have to say next slide because I'm doing it now. Okay, so uh, uh, let's just talk a little bit about what we mean by strengths. Um, again, these are the internal resources uh, that help the coalition and, and all of you as participating stakeholders accomplish the ship mission and, and that, and that um, vision and that Dr. Cuffey talked uh, about this morning when we first um, convened. And so um, examples can include um, uh, if you feel like the, 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 the University of Delaware team that's at the table is providing perfective management and facilitation uh, and the support we're providing in primary data collection. And please feel free to um, don't hold back. We will, we want to hear all of your feedback, um, you know, good, bad, and ugly. Um, that's how we can, you know, improve and work with uh, public health with the project management of SHIP. Um, if there's uh, active and diverse membership, um, we've had, you've had, you've brought up great questions this morning about making sure that the state health assessment report is inclusive and especially. Um, is highlighting our most vulnerable populations and subgroups within that, making sure that granular data really tells that full story. Um, and then um, communication network, community awareness and engagement. These are all examples um, that could be strengths. And I'm not saying they are. Um, you need to tell us what they are. So uh, when you go in your breakout groups, you're going to be, um, every breakout group is going to be doing the same thing. We're going to break you down just into smaller groups so we can have more informal conversations. And we'd like you to identify the strengths give a description, and if you have options for how do we preserve or enhance that strength moving forward. Again, after the state health assessment report is written, we'll be moving into, with public health um, support, a, uh, a, a state health improvement planning process. So when then we will then use this data and every everything from the report and this SWOC analysis to then begin to work with everyone to write um, and draft strategies. Um, and um, and and goals and objectives around the next five-year plan. And really the readiness 
um, or capacity of an organization to, under, uh, to undertake a strategic planning process like state health improvement planning um, should be you know, really clearly understood by the members around the table um, and leaders before the process has begun. So that's why the SWAC analysis is important now so we can go through that. In terms of weaknesses, um, these are internal deficiencies or resources or capabilities that hinder this coalition and its participating groups in fulfilling the, the mission. Um, it could be poor internal uh, and external communications. Um, if you feel like there's a, the mission um, was uh, unclear or, or too vague, structural misalignments, inadequate resources. Um, it could be, um, you know, where we have a focus in our, the you all, helped write the mission and vision, but a focus of that is definitely on health equity. So we know when it comes to equity, we have to also examine, are there weaknesses around power? Who has more power? Who has less? Um, are we working to build community power and the voices of those most impacted by poor health outcomes in Delaware? Um, is there transparency in the process, et cetera? So these are all things that we, um, and we'll have some prompt questions from our facilitators to help your um, your, your, um, to really share around those things in the in the um, breakout rooms. For in terms of um, opportunities, the O, these are again, things external to this coalition um, or your organizations that really can, um, um, uh, that really we can take advantage of potentially to better fulfill the SHIP mission. Maybe it's some of those new policies that Danielle uh, shared that are coming, that are getting implemented. Are those opportunities to really enhance um, are there um, increases in community power organizing underway where we're really seeing power shift in terms of um, making sure that those um, communities that have been historically disinvested in or um, and, and, and bear the burden of health inequities in Delaware have more um, power in the conversation and in the advocacy needed to, to get resources they need. We know that health inequities are the you know in unequal distribution of resources. These are preventable things over time um, that result in, in poor health. Um, and then uh, could it be other opportunities or new funding sources, new partnerships, um, new or pending state or federal policy changes, or opportunities maybe to even modify outdated mandates or things that need to be changed or um, further enhanced. So just some examples. So we want you to name the opportunity, describe it, and then are there options for leveraging, leveraging that in the process? Finally, we have challenges. So those are, again, outside factors or situations that really hinder our ability to fulfill the mission in, in a negative way. And so these might be political, economic, and social forces, maybe changes in technology. Those, two, again, could be opportunities or challenges um, that we're um, facing that could hinder the mission fulfillment. Um, again, lack of transparency, maybe loss of funding, new unfunded mandates, lack of public support. Is there a poor image or reputation about, um, you know, something that we're doing or um, the uh, maybe those of you that have been involved in SHIP for a long time feel um, have, you know, uh, reactions to that process? Um, are we are there things we need to learn to do better um, externally um, to respond to to make sure that, um, you know, there's there's interest in. Uh, and there's political will to move towards the um, the, the ship mission and, and vision. So at this point, um, we're going to uh, uh, move you into um, uh, breakout rooms. And then when we're done, we'll come back to this main room. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your conversations in the breakout room. Our group had a really great conversation going, um, and, and one of our participants was in the process of sharing as we were coming back. But um, I just wanted to ask if anyone quickly wanted to share anything that came out of their group. I'll share. Um, I mean, our group had a lot of great feedback. Um, and I know they wanted to see uh, the items that we went over and all of the things that we're going over. They wanted to see like a, pretty much a follow up on what is being implemented and what programs come out of this. Um, and I think that was awesome. They asked a lot of questions surrounding funding and how long this was being funded for. We shared with them that it was five years. So they wanted to know like in that time, um, pretty much when when would they start to see like the programs come in and pretty much the shifts and the reason, the why we're here and hopefully seeing some outcomes. So I thought that those were really great points and um, 
just wanted to share it with everyone else so that they're aware as well. Thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate it. And in our group, we actually talked a little bit about just thinking about all the years of SHIP and kind of going back and looking at the data and the trends that we have and the information that we've collected over time. Um, so I think that's a really nice co connection between thinking about the past and the history, but also moving forward with the future looks like. So thank you all again for your participation. Uh, next slide, please. So again, thank you all for your participation today. We really appreciate it. It was really encouraging to see new people joining us. We actually had two new people in our group, um, but we're so thankful for all of you and your continued participation and engagement um, in the coalition. So our next meeting will be held on June 1st, 2023. Again, the same time, 11 to 1 p.m. on Zoom. Next slide. And so just to give you a sense of our timeline and our June meeting, what we really like to focus on are the themes from our data collection. And we wanna highlight any of the major findings that we have and actually share that with you. We're also planning to share a draft of our communication plan. And then this will actually be during our public comment period. So it'll be an opportunity for you all to review and provide feedback. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you during this process. And then when we shift to our summer, July and August, that'll actually be the kickoff of developments of the state health improvement plan. And that'll be based on the findings of the shop. Uh, so thank you all again for your time today. We look forward to meeting with you this summer and we look forward to connecting again. Thank you very much. <laughs>